everybody. We're here for week three of the MVPs of the OT series, and I'm here with our very own Case Calvert. Case was on the 2011 Power Soccer World Cup team. In fact, you won a gold medal, correct? Correct, yes. Yeah, and I've, I've got them with me right here. I don't know why I asked you, because I actually have them. Uh, here is yours, and then your dad was actually on the staff. Check that out. How cool is that? Uh, and so you got first place in the, in Paris, France, correct? Correct. Couple yeah, there. we uh, beat out ten other teams to win the gold medal. Oh my goodness! From all over the world. Yeah, all over you know Australia, Japan, England, all all over the place. And so power soccer, you actually play soccer in your wheelchair, and it is intense. I've seen it. Yeah, it's pretty intense. You know, like the ball's kicked about uh, forty miles an hour or so. <laughs> like the, oh, I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, and like the chair is specifically. For the sport, it's like an $8,000 chair just to play power soccer. Oh my goodness, man. That's so, that's incredible. Is it okay if I put it on, if I wear the gold medal? Is yeah, that yeah, cool? Yeah. I'd love, I've never had one of these before, and I'd love to wear it for the interview. That's awesome. I'll hold the other one right here. And so let me ask now, you, you won the 2011 World Cup Power Soccer uh, in Paris, France. Teams from all over the country there. Um, but tell us uh, uh, your story a little bit. Like, how did how did you end up in a wheelchair, and what's you know the physical troubles that you've had to face in your life? So, like growing up, like uh, I've had trouble issues walking and falling and kind of stumbling. So, like uh, about age eight, we kind of figured out. We took a test and realized that I had Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Okay. So about age eight is kind of when I kind of figured out, like, oh, okay, so this is what was causing all these issues walking and um, about age 11 I broke my ankle and that kind of was the initial step to kind of really put me in a chair. It was inevitable but that was really kind of the, for me, that point in my life where like, okay, that I knew it changed. And So yeah, I, muscular dystrophy, tell us, for those that aren't familiar, what does that mean for your life? Uh, so it's a progressive uh, muscular disease. So. Over time, my muscles will weaken and slowly deteriorate. So like the first muscles to go are, are walking, your leg muscles, calves, those kind of things. So that really kind of puts someone in a wheelchair pretty early on. Um, it's progressive, but for me, it's like, I, I just feel kind of good about it. It's like there's so many blessings that I can think of. Yeah, it sucks that I'm in the, you know, it's, it's just kind of unfortunate circumstances, but there's a lot of, blessings from it um, that I can really get out of it. Well, okay, so that's their physical condition, but tell us your spiritual story a little bit. Today we're talking about David and some of the obstacles he had to face. Uh, obviously, you've had some physical obstacles, and yet, I mean, you, you've won a gold medal in power soccer, and you are one of the most positive people I've ever met. So how how are you able to do that? Um, I think really, honestly, like I, I grew up going to a Lutheran school, like just being always a data into that uh, community and knowing that you know God has a plan for me. Um, you know, some days it's not easy. Some days having someone to get me up in the morning, get me dressed, and do these things, it, it could be a struggle. But I think for me growing up, knowing that God had a purpose and a plan, that I'm not a mistake. I'm not uh, just something that people have to do things for me. It's like He's put me in this chair for a reason, and I think just kind of thinking about my future and just being positive that there's a plan and purpose for my life. Uh, one of my favorite verses is Philippians 4, verse 11. Yeah. That's, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, but I've learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. Wow. So I'm trying to be content in where I'm at right now. Not complacent, but content with what he has and has in store for me. Because I know that all these things that I may be struggling with, he has a plan for. Yeah, and how do you feel content in that moment because I mean I talk to so many people who struggle with feeling content I guess how, how does why does that verse speak to you um because I feel like for me it speaks to me because I don't want to just live worrying about my disability yeah uh, so just being content that he's provided the necessities that I need in my life he's provided things financially and I'm just content that he has a plan and knows what it, what's, knows what I need out of life. Yeah. Well, man, you're such an encouragement to me, and I love uh, your your walk with the Lord. So, thanks for doing this, um, Case Calvin, everybody. 2011 U.S. Power World Cup champion, gold medalist. 
Uh, also the best dressed person in Mercy Road Church. Uh, can we thank Case for being here today? And we're going to go back to the message now. Such an uh, honor to be able to interview you. Love Case's story. That's so cool. The first week we gave you a professional baseball player. Last week, professional uh, Indianapolis Colts player, offensive tackle. And this week, we thought we'd let you know, you know, you don't have to be a professional sports player in order to be a spiritual MVP. And I wonder how many of us, if we were given cases, circumstances in life, would be able to make some of the statements that he made there. Man, I know hearing that it was, did you catch when he said he was not a mistake and it was a blessing at times? Like, that's hard, I think, for some of us to fathom. Yet he's a guy who is so positive in every way, taking life uh, by the horns. In fact, he's not here this weekend because, ladies and gentlemen, he is on his bachelor celebration as he is out. He's getting married this spring to Becca Berry here in our church. So he's out at his bachelor bash and not with us this weekend. And I've been reflecting on Case's story and the circumstances he faced that weren't his choices. And we're going to look at the life of David in the Old Testament who makes some choices that cause some problems in his life and some difficult circumstances. And I hope we can learn from him. Turn in your Bible to Psalm 139. Psalm 139 in the Old Testament. We're going to look at what I think is probably one of the greatest hits in the book of Psalms. In fact, as you're turning there, can you go ahead and pull out a card that looks like this? Go ahead. Just pull that out of your program for a moment. You know, we get so busy at church. Could we just appreciate the awesome nature of this card this morning? Go ahead and pull that out. It's funny. I've said this is the weirdest thing we've ever done as a church. Uh, Some think it's the coolest thing we've ever done. So many of you have been like, dude, this is so awesome. Every week, your limited edition collector's card is here, baby. Don't throw that in the trash. That is valuable. You want to list that on eBay? You go right ahead. In fact, next weekend, for those who have collected all four, there will be a special prize. And for the adults, we're not sure what it's going to be yet. Maybe a pat on the back. But for the kids... We've got some special things planned. They're going to get a free action Bible that's going to be personalized. There's going to be a ceremony to celebrate the whole thing. It's going to be really cool. Uh, Don't miss it. Be sure and take your card, put it in your pocket, or find a protective sleeve to place that thing in. As we dive into Psalm 139 and we look at the story of David, we'll talk about, I think David, to me, might be the most important of all of the characters we'll study. At least his life had the biggest impact. Both the good, considered to be this great king in Israelite history, he will have the, the lineage of, da- of, uh, of Jesus will come from David. And at the same time, his poor choices will end up splitting the kingdom in two by the time his grandchildren are around. He has a wake of impact, both good and bad, and he most likely wrote Psalm 139 towards the end of his life as he's reflecting on the good and the bad, and he's reminded of God's character. And as I read these words, I've thought about this this week. Could I, could you and I both, could we write a song like this? Consider this maybe to be uh, his greatest song, his greatest hit on his platinum album, Psalm 139 as he talks about later in his life, his experiences with God. Are you ready to study God's word together, church? It says this in verse one. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created, you know this part, my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. 
I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of the sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. If only you, God, would slay the wicked. Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Turn to the neighbor on your right and on your left and tell him, I think this message is for you this morning. Go ahead and do that real quick. I think it's it's not for me, it's for you. You you really need to hear this. I want to show you through the life of David, someone who's learned from his good and his bad choices, that you can't be content in whatever your circumstances because of the relationship you have with your heavenly father, that you've understood his love and devotion to you. Will you pray with me? God, We just pause in the busyness of today, and we acknowledge your presence with us right now. It's been an incredible weekend already. Saw about a dozen people give their life to Christ just at this last service, God, and and it's not because of anything special. It's because you're real. And God, I just pray you'd speak to us in a new way. Some of us have been Christians a really long time, and we need to hear from you, see you with fresh eyes. Some of us walked into this facility and felt uncomfortable. We didn't know anybody. Some of us, the first time we've been here or in any church facility ever. And we started this church with people just like that. We pray you'd speak to us, Lord Jesus. We pray this in your name and all God's family said, amen. Amen. Anybody out there not like music? You you do not like music. Uh, There has not been a single hand at one of the services so so far uh, this weekend. Everybody loves music. They say that music is the language of the soul. Not really sure what that means, but apparently it means that we like to sing. I, I, you, don't, you don't know this. I, I'm, I'm actually a, a really good singer. You don't hear it very often, mainly because Eric won't let me sing on the stage. That's why I usually try and sit in the front row, hoping the microphones might pick my voice up. But I do my best singing where most of you do in the shower. I don't know why. There's just something about me and hot water and no clothes. It just, I just, my best creative thoughts come out during those moments. Maybe that's you. Maybe you've dreamed about writing your best hit someday, your greatest hit. Uh, David in this passage is going to write what will become his platinum song. It will be the one that I really feel like is a testimony of his life as he declares who God is in his life. I was thinking about this. Um, I don't know what would be on your top 10 list of songs of all time, like the greatest songs. We, we love music because it's, it comes from our soul. It, it communicates emotions that have boiled over in us. I, I was a, a communication major in college. Yes, that's a real degree. And I specialized in theater and I always hated musicals. Fellas, you hate musicals until I realized the idea of a musical was that your emotions were built up so much. You had no other choice but to just belt it out in song to express what you were feeling. You're expressing the human condition. In fact, uh, I don't know what your top 10 songs are. Uh, This wouldn't be on my list, but it would be on the top 10 songs I'd never heard of until recently. It's a song that Matt Mellinger in the back introduced me to, uh, Michael Jackson, Human Nature. Anybody out there? No? Yes? Oh, come on now. Jan, I know you. Yeah, come on. Michael, you love it. You know that song? No? Tell them that it's human nature. Why? Rand, you know it. Did they do me that way? Did you do me that way? Why didn't you join in and sing with me right there? I really could have used some backup choruses. Uh, I won't do that again the rest of the service. But you will love that song because he's like, he's talking about the human condition. Why did you do that to me? Why did, you, why did you do that? There's something about human nature. All you have to do is, Pastor Darren did an excellent job. We posted a clip of this online on social media talking about the, the shootings that happened just over a week ago. 
Just one more thing to demonstrate the violence and the natural proclivity towards hatred that we have in our culture and our society. All you got to do is turn on the news or look at social media and we can express our anger for one another and we hate each other's media programs and we hate each other's words and politicians and and then globally, it's not much different. Threats of nuclear war in the last year and the things that come with that. There's something about the human nature that, that David is not foreign to, by the way. He's familiar what this life is like, both the good and the bad. And he's made some of the poor choices and the hatred and the violence that we have seen. Some of it was good and some of it was bad. In fact, if you're not familiar with the story of David, the reason I think it's so particularly important is because it is one of the things throughout the Old Testament that comes up all the time. In fact, his story goes like this. You're probably a little familiar. He's like this little shepherd boy, young teenager, whose dad sends him to the front lines. He was too young to fight, but he's bringing food to his brothers. And, and, and when he gets there, he sees this nine-foot giant. Goliath, you may not even be a Christian, but you're familiar with this story. And this, this giant is not just calling out the army, uh, the Philistines are calling out the army of the Israelites, he's calling out God himself. And he's saying, send out your champion because I'm going to kill him and then you'll be our slaves. And David shows up and no one's been doing anything for quite some time, and he's like, you manzy pansies, get behind me for a second. He's like, do you know the God that you serve? He will not call out. He goes and he picks up a rock, right? You know the story, you saw it on Veggie Tales, and he gets it like this, <laughs> bam, knocks Goliath dead right in that moment. And then we usually stop the story there. But have you read 1 Samuel 17? Why do we tell this story to children? He goes over. I'm going to keep it PG for the room, but this is in the Bible. He goes over. He t this child takes this giant nine-foot man's sword with everybody watching, and he chops off a part of Goliath's body. And then he picks up at least, this is how in every artistic rendition it is, including the collector's item that you got in your program. We've replaced it with a soccer ball. But it's supposed to be a piece of Goliath's body that he's raising up in victory. That's what's happening. Now, I don't know. Maybe he was boasting in the Lord. I, I'm not sure. Or maybe that was when his pride began to get a hold of him. Because David would have some serious issues with pride. In fact, eventually he would raise up into power, become a great warrior, become king. And then when he's king, he's got everything. He's got all, everything he ever dreamed of. He had a problem with the ladies. And he sees this woman, whether it was on the roof or through a window, she was uh, taking a bath. Her name was Bathsheba. It was really creative. <laughs> and he sees her there and he's like, oh, yeah, he starts lusting. They hook up. Uh, she gets pregnant. He realizes there's a problem, so not only did he commit adultery, he takes the next step and he assassinates essentially her husband, Uriah the Hittite. So now we got murder, we got idolatry in David's story. And he experiences all these good things and these bad things, and then most scholars believe at the end of his life he writes this song as a way of declaring God uh, here's how much I love you and why I love you because through my choices and my decisions, I have seen your character remain consistent. I believe it's why Case in that video can have the response that he has because he's understood his purpose, his love from God, and he realized that living and existing for a greater reason than for himself is more meaningful. It is encouraging and challenging to me. Maybe it is to you as well. Because here's what happens. Most of us, I've worked with young adults a long time. And maybe you're in your early 20s or so, and you're asking big theological, spiritual, philosophical questions like, why do I exist? Why am I here on this planet? Am I loved? Am I known? Does anybody care about me? Is anybody thinking about me? And all these big questions, right? Right? And then you, one day, you get a job, and you get a checking account, a savings account, and then you start saving up, and maybe you buy a house, or maybe you get a dog, or maybe you go and you get married, and then you have 2.3 kids with your dog named Ralph. I don't know why Ralph, but you chose to name the dog that. 
And then you get your goldfish, and the goldfish dies, and you replace it with another goldfish, but don't tell the kids, because who knows the difference anyway, right? And before you know it, your life goes from these big, cosmic, theological, spiritual questions of who am I, why do I exist, to did you pick up the diapers on the way home from work today, right? How did Jet get the Cheerio inside of the nose? Like, how did that happen? I don't know. And all of a sudden, you were overwhelmed with these practical questions, and you're just faced with the reality of not, why do I exist, where am I, but can I get through another day? Can I exist? And you survive, and the kids grow up, and before you know, they're out of the house, and you look at the person you used to know 30 years ago and go, what are, what's going on? And so then you begin to go, well, we got to do something. So you go, and you live down in Florida for three months out of the year. You get a customized golf cart. You put on a few pounds, and you golf every day asking the same spiritual questions that you asked when you started. And I wonder... If in in David's words here, he's beginning to speak to us about what he's learned and what we could learn from him. And I'm going to tell you, I went with the handheld this weekend because I'm going old school. I'm going to let some stuff out that I don't know I normally keep repressed. So prepare yourself spiritually for that. And verses 1 through 5, he begins to detail, number one, God, you know me. In a world where we want desire intimacy with relationships with other people, like you know me. Look at those first few verses with me. It said this, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. Go down to verse 4, before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You know everything about me. God, I've always wanted a relationship with somebody who truly knew me, who I really was. He knows you better than any human being on this planet ever will. Think about that for a second. He, he keeps the earth spinning on its axis while it does an elliptical orbit around the sun, while the moon rotates around our planet, while other planets rotate around the sun throughout our galaxy, one small part of a greater universe, a multiverse. He keeps it all together, and he still knows the depth of my soul and what's going on in my life. Really, God, you care that much? But he doesn't just know you, he's also present in your life. It's one thing to know about somebody, it's another thing to be present, to be there for him. David declares, you don't just know me, you are there for me. Look at verses 7 to 10. He essentially says, I can't get away from you, God. Verse 7, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise in the wings of the dawn and if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Your hand will be upon me, Lord. You are there. You were always there. You were there when I graduated high school and my parents saw me and we had that celebration. You were there when I got my first automobile. You were there when I got married. You were there when I got divorced. You were there when I went through the financial breakdown and the bankruptcy. You were, you were there when my kid began to get addicted to the very things I used to struggle with. You were there. David says, in the good and in the bad, you're there. And you're not just there. Look at verse 11 to 12. That you are there even in the dark times. And the dark times aren't dark when you are there. Verse 11 even your hand will guide me. Verse 11, sorry. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me. Verse 12, even the darkness will not be dark to you. That if the room is pitch dark and God walks into it, he just lit that room up. The darkness is not dark to him. God, I know that I went through these dark times and David, I made some really poor choices and yet you did not give up on me. In fact, in verse 18 that we'll eventually get to, when he wakes up from the morning after doing things in the darkness, God's still sitting there right with me. He never gave up. And he's not just there in the dark times and in the good times. He was there since the beginning. Verse 13, the famous verses in the passage here. It says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. As Case said, there is not a single mistake person who is a mistake in this room. 
that you were intentionally created, that he was there when the spark of life began. In fact, he, I know this full well, David writes, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. Look at verse 16. Your eyes saw my unformed body. When, when I didn't, David says, when I didn't even have eyes to see yet, you saw me. When I was just this mass of cells in my mother's womb, you were there. You've always been present, and you've cared about me from day one. In my past, my present, and my future, we believe as Christians, he's here with us right now. Even the times in my life I have rejected him, and I have run from him, and I have not acknowledged him, you're there. And isn't it interesting how ridiculously fleeting we are as human beings? We talk about the human condition. This is what it's like. We can come to a place like this at church and we can sing the songs and we can study the Bible and do all that stuff. And we can really be passionate and get excited and, and really love the Lord. And then we get into our everyday life and somebody says something to us that we don't like. We don't get the promotion at work. We, we don't get the $1.25 raise that we were really counting on. Right? And you know what you do. You Don't lie to me. You do it. All of a sudden, this one little thing happens, and then you're like, are you really there, God? Are you there? Did you forget about me? You been there? 2013, Notre Dame Fighting Irish got obliterated by the Alabama Crimson Time, the Tide, and the evil Nick Sabans of the world by 40-some points. And I cried out to God, God, are you even there? Do you even exist anymore? I don't know what your dark times are, but I make light of it because the reality is I think sometimes God looks down on what's going on in our lives and just smiles like, Josh, yeah, I was, I'm there. I'm still there with you, and I still care about you more than any human being, and I love you, and I pursue you. And in fact, he's not just there, and he doesn't just know you. He's also involved. He's involved in what's going on. Look at the second half of verse 16 there. It says that he was there with your unformed body, All the days ordained for me were written in your book. Now, I know it's an analogy, but let's play with it for a second. It says, all of the things that you have done, are doing, and will do, it's written down in a book. That he's known everything, every decision, every choice that we were going to make, all the things that were going to happen. David declares, you knew the choices that I would make. Now, stop for just a second. I know there's a big theological discussion we don't have time for, which is we have God's sovereignty that he knows everything and it's written down in a book. And at the same time, David had some choices in his life. And I don't know whether you're a predestination Calvinist or maybe you're an Arminian or maybe you're over here on this circle and and you're uh, all for free will or maybe you believe in God-ordained choice. Either way, God's sovereign in the Bible, and there somehow has to be worked in some choice. And then I had two things on that. Anybody who tells you they 100%, without a shadow of a doubt, have it all figured out, you need to run the other way because they're not God. But secondly, on that particular thing, that God in that moment definitely is sovereign, and we do have choice in some way. And David's choices lead to some good things in his life of seeing God show up and give victory over the Philistines and some bad things in his life like murder and adultery. Now, I don't know about you and what the chapters in your life story are, in your book are, but I'm going to guess most of the people in the room or those watching online, there isn't a chapter about both murder and adultery in your book. And so don't judge me, judge David. David in the psalm is crying out, God, you knew me in the chapters of my book and you still made me? I mean, think about that. If, if I was God and I knew there would be a chapter in adult, adultery and murder and a complete uh, split of the kingdom, I would probably burn the book, get rid of the blob. We don't need to deal with this anymore. It's a good thing I'm not God. And too often I make God in my own image rather than realizing that we are made in the image of God. And God's not like me and he's not like you. And David says, you knew me, you were there for me, and you're involved. You knew the chapters of my book and you still made me? Are you kidding me, God? And this is when his song begins to boil up a little bit. The emotions begin to come out even more because number four, he doesn't just involve in your life. He's always thinking about you. Always thinking about you. Verses 17 and 18 there, 
It, it literally talks about his, his thoughts for you are as many as the sand on the seashore. Have you ever tried to count the granules of sand on a seashore? I wouldn't encourage you to do it. It's so overwhelming. God's love for you, his pursuit of you, he thinks of you so much, it's overwhelming. He's obsessed with you. That's what God is like. And David declares, you know me, you love me. And then at the end of verse 18, it says, and when I wake up in the morning, you're there in the darkness. Let's be honest. Some of us, some of us, no fingers pointed, in the darkness of the night, there are some wild aspects of our life we would rather not talk about in a place like this. David had some things. He said, when I wake up, you're still there. You're still there. I love you, God. And then the depth of his love begins to come out a little bit. You're not just there. You're not just involved. You're always thinking and obsessed with me. But then look what happens next in verse 19 to 22. If only you, God, would slay the wicked away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord? I thought we weren't supposed to hate. And abhor those who are in rebellion against you. I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. This is where the song goes from like Michael Jackson, the pop culture song to like 80s, 90s, like classic rock here. In just this moment, it's like, oh, 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 thunder. It's picking up a little bit. He says, you know me, you love me, you're involved in me, you care. I love you, God. I love everything about you. I don't just love you. I hate those who hate you. That's the depth of my love for you. Have you ever had a friend who is so loyal to you in the good and the bad, no matter what happened in their life? They're kind when no one else is. They're a shoulder to cry on when no one else cares. They're always there and involved, and they're always thinking about you. If somebody says anything bad about them, you love them so much, you're like, oh, no, you don't talk bad about them. Uh Uh-uh not going to happen. I love them and I hate those who hate them. That's the type of love that David has for his heavenly father after he sees how he's responded to his choices in life. If I could be totally honest, I look at this song and I read it and I think about it and I reflect on it. I go, I'm not so sure I could write a song like that. Not just the words, I mean with my life. Do do I have that type of love and appreciation for my Heavenly Father? You ever meet somebody who's had their dad or their mom taken from them and they realize how they took that for granted for so long? And this Heavenly Father that is always perfect, is always there, was always present, was always involved, was always thinking about you, was obsessed with you, loves you in the good and the bad, If he was gone from our lives, we would miss it and we would appreciate it with a love that we've never felt this side of heaven. And so I've I've been reflecting on this, that maybe there are people here today or watching online that God has been speaking to you and pursuing you and pursuing you and telling you the depth of his love for you. And we haven't responded to say, God, I love you back so much. I love everything about you. And this world doesn't need any more hate, but I want to love you so much that anything, anything that becomes between you and me, I'm going to stand up for it because I want to be present in your life the way you have been present in mine. 